Good morning, church. Thank you for choosing to worship with us today. My name is Leon, and I have the privilege of bringing you the announcements this morning. Special welcome to those of you who are joining us for the first time. We are excited to have you with us. Our leaders would love to know how they can be praying for you. Be sure to click on the Hope Praise link on the top right corner of our website to submit your prayer requests. It is a joy to be praying for you. Our next church-wide prayer night is happening this Wednesday on May 19th from 7.30 to 9 p.m. Please register by Tuesday, May 18th by emailing info at hopeottawa.ca and we will send you the link for it. Are you looking to make Hope Ottawa your home church? Do you want to find more about the beliefs, the leadership, and the mission of our church? Do you want to get plugged into a small group and a service team? Then be sure to sign up for our next Discover Hope Step 2 class. This is a two-part class which will be held online on May 23 and June 13 from 1 to 3 p.m. You can sign up on our website at hopeottawa.ca slash discover2. Thank you for your continued faithfulness in giving to the work of the Lord. Here at Hope, we view the giving of our tithes and offerings as an act of worship to the Lord. I want to encourage you to continue giving generously, sacrificially, and joyfully as the Lord leads. You can give online at hopeottawa.ca slash give. Now, let's stand and worship the Lord together as we join our brothers and sisters from Hope Bible Church Oakville, who will be leading us in worship today. Wherever you are, why don't you stand with us and let's worship the Lord together this morning.
brought me out of darkness, you have filled me with peace. Give of mercy, you're my help in time. But I can't help but say.
no greater truth than this There is no stronger love we know God himself comes down to live He makes the sin as hard as throne Bible Church Ottawa Pastor Ray here love you so much so thankful for you and thankful to be worshiping together with you today and right now I have a great privilege it is my privilege to introduce to you our guest preacher today who's going to be bringing us God's word his name is Chris Shipley and Chris is the pastor of sending and counseling at Hope Church Mississauga which is one of our partner churches here in the Great Commission Collective the fellowship of churches that we are a part of and personally 
uh, Chris and his wife Lisa are dear friends of Natalie and myself and it's been almost 10 years that God by his grace has given us to minister together for the glory of Jesus Christ and so we are so thankful for that partnership in the gospel and I know you are going to be blessed today and hey will you keep Chris and Lisa and Hope Church Mississauga in your prayers moving forward man let's press in fervently for our brothers and sisters in Christ so let's open up our Bibles turn to Philippians chapter 1 and let's get ready to hear a word from the Lord. Hey Hope Ottawa, my name is Chris Shipley. I'm one of the pastors here at Hope Mississauga and we love you guys. We love your church and I wish that I could be there this morning uh, but it is a real joy just to be able to open up God's word with you and look particularly at the book of Philippians and the prayer that Paul prays and the topic of prayer. And so my prayer is that you'd be greatly helped as we look at prayer. May the Lord bless you. Looking forward to seeing you again face-to-face one day. God bless. Well, why don't you grab a journal or something to take some notes in and turn open your Bible to Philippians chapter 1. We're going to be continuing in our new sermon series, Joy Inside. And we're going to be looking at prayer. You know, what is prayer? Uh, Prayer is just simply talking with God. It's something that we've been doing since the beginning of our spiritual walk with God. Much like how a baby just knows how to cry out for milk as soon as it's born. So we know how to pray right from the beginning. And yet, it's something that we grow in. We learn, we develop and mature in over time. And have you ever wondered what we're actually supposed to say when we pray? What are we supposed to be talking to God about? It's right and good for us to cast all of our cares upon the Lord because he cares for us. Uh, Things that we should be praying about for provision and protection, health, safety, uh, employment, shelter. These are all good things to talk to God about and cast your cares on him because he cares for us. But is there something more significant, something more foundational, something more all-encompassing, a higher priority of prayer that we can pray in any situation, no matter what our circumstance. Well, that's actually what Paul is going to give us here today in these three concise passages in verses 9, 10, and 11. So why don't we read those passages here. This is Paul's prayer. He says, My prayer is that your love may abound more and more with all knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. This is one of the clearest and most concise prayers that Paul has that really highlights his priorities in praying for believers. He could have prayed about all sorts of stuff, But he really zeroes in on five essential things that we ought to be praying for as believers at all times. And here's the first one. He prays that our hearts would be full of love. He prays that our hearts would be full of love. Paul prays that, in fact, our hearts would abound more and more excessively, spilling over with love. Uh, Love for what? Uh, Well, we're not told explicitly uh, in this sentence, but it's actually implicitly in all throughout his letter that we are to love one another just as God has loved us. Uh, This comes out in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, when Paul says, So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, that's his love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, that love for one another. Our love for one another is to be the same kind of love that God through Christ has loved us with. This is the love that Paul is praying that would abound more and more. Now, this shouldn't surprise us that Paul would make this the highest priority in his prayers for us as believers that we would abound in love because this is actually the greatest commandment in the whole Bible. Jesus himself affirms this in Matthew 22, 37 to 40, when he says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, 
and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Now later, Jesus even raises the bar and says that the standard of love is now himself. He says this in John 13, 34 to 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus is the standard. And so we are to love God and to love others just as Jesus loved God and loved others. And when we do so, we actually become more and more like Jesus. We begin to sound and look more and more like Christ. And this is really where we get the idea of growing in godliness, is really growing in Christ-likeness, that people begin to see and hear the love of God coming out of our lives because we're actually becoming someone new. Well, what kind of love is this? What kind of love is Paul specifically getting at that would abound more and more? What is it like to love in a way that Christ loved? Well, that's the second point here that Paul prays for, is that our love would be full of truth. Our love would be full of truth. Our love is not to be like yeah, a jellyfish that's mushy emotionalism or sentimentalism. No, our love instead is to be a love for God and for one another that is trained in the truth of God. It's fortified in the knowledge of God. It is guided and directed by the wisdom of God. God. And that's why Paul prays in verse 9 that this love would abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. Our love is to be full of knowledge, not just random facts that you're going to shout out while watching Jeopardy from the couch. No, this is knowledge that is biblically based. It's spiritually based. This word literally means knowledge of God. It's, it's knowledge that's about God, which we find in the Word of God, the Bible. Now, the Bible talks about how we can know some things about God, uh, even outside of Scripture, as we look around, say, for instance, in creation. The Bible talks about how we can learn about the Creator, how, about God's power and His intelligence, just by looking at creation itself. Uh, the Bible also talks about how we can learn Things about God from our own conscience, knowing good and evil and what when we've done right and wrong and knowing that we'll stand before him and give an account. And yet the Bible is also really clear that even though creation is speaking and our conscience is speaking, they don't say enough. Uh, they don't tell us enough about God. They don't tell us enough about us. They don't tell us enough about how to get right with God. And so we need God to say some more words. We need God to speak more, and he has. He's revealed himself exclusively in the scriptures, in the word of God. And it's through the word of God that we come to know who God is and what he's done and what he has said about himself, about us, about everything around us, the world, so that we can rightly know God and truly know and love God. And so our love for God is to be informed and shaped and fueled by the knowledge of God from his word. But you'll notice here that Paul just doesn't pray for knowledge itself, but he couples it with all discernment. And that's because we're not supposed to just be uh, kind of a a storage container of facts about God, but we need wisdom to know how do we live this out? We need wisdom to know how do we apply what we have been taught? And that's why Paul prays that our love would be not only filled with knowledge, but all discernment. Discernment here is simply the wisdom to know what to do with the truth that we've been taught. And so God is offering us his wisdom and discernment in all of the commands that he gives us in Scripture. Every time we hear commands from the Lord, like repent and believe, this is wise. 
Uh, to give under Caesar what is Caesar's. This is wise. Uh, to turn the other cheek or to love one another. This is wisdom from God. It's as though our Heavenly Father is speaking to us, His children, and giving us good, godly counsel to live discerning and wise lives, to know what to do with the truth that He has taught us from His Word. And so, knowledge and wisdom, knowledge and discernment, mingled and mixed in with God's love, is exactly what we need and what we need to pray for. Because when that happens, it doesn't stay idle. It doesn't just sit there. It moves. It acts. It's kind of like if you were to drop Mentos into cola or baking soda into vinegar. If you start dropping biblical truth into godly love, things are going to happen. Things are going to start spilling over and moving. And that's exactly what it's supposed to do. Our love, when it's rightly saturated with God's knowledge and discernment, it moves us into action. And that's the third thing that Paul actually prays for here in our passage. He prays that not only our hearts would be full of love and that our love would be full of truth, but that then we would actually act on what is excellent. We would act on what is excellent. It's exactly what he says in verse 10. So that you may approve what is excellent. The, the love and the knowledge of God is not meant to be stored away in the back of the fridge to rot and expire. It's meant to be brought out and eaten right away, to be applied, tasted, and tested right away. This is actually what the word approved means. It means that it would be tested and tasted, personally experienced, so that I can firsthand, from my own experience, be able to say, yeah, this is right. This is good. I can verify that personally. It's very similar to how uh, people would authenticate bills and coins and currency to see whether it was counterfeit or authentic. God calls us to taste and see that the Lord is good and say that along with the psalmist in Psalm 34 verse 8. And that his way is perfect, that the word of the Lord proves true. Psalm 18 verse 8. 30. God's love filled with biblical truth and wisdom helps us make discerning choices so that we can know the right path to take, what direction to go, what's the most excellent way and the most God-honoring way given any situation. Now, sometimes this is uh, easier than in other spots. Uh, sometimes it's easy because it's simply a matter of right and wrong and following what the Bible has clearly already said. So, for example, discerning what the most excellent way would be between buying something versus stealing it or marrying, say, an unbeliever versus a believer. The Bible has spoken very clearly about these things, that we should not steal and not marry unbelievers as believers. And yet, sometimes there are situations that are a little bit more difficult to discern because you have two options that are biblically permissible, and they may simply be an issue of context and conscience. Uh, so, for example, um, you may be trying to decide between what college to go to, this one or that, or what job to take, this one or that. Uh, whether you should cut your hair or dye your hair, whether you should get a tattoo or have a glass of wine or do none of those things what you should do about your kid's education or vaccinations or whether you should be a vegetarian or a vegan or a carnivore or an omnivore. All of these things, they're conscience related and context shaped. So for example, if I were to eat bacon in the morning and yet offer ham to mess Messianic Jews that I was hosting for supper, that wouldn't be the wisest thing to do. That wouldn't be the most loving thing I could do. And so context shapes and informs what might be the wisest approach. What's the most excellent way given this situation? Now to clarify, we're not talking about something that's wrong suddenly becoming right. It's two options that are right, but what one is most wise? And God, by his word, by the Holy Spirit, gives us wisdom to know and approve what is the most excellent way in this situation. And this is what Paul is praying for, that we would act on what is excellent, that we would approve what is best. And when we do, when 
out of love and our love shaped and filled with God's truth takes those steps of faith and acts on that knowledge and wisdom, we begin to bear fruit in our lives. And this is the fourth thing that Paul prays for. He prays that our lives would be full of fruit, full of fruit. He says in verse 11 that our lives would be filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. Now, fruit here simply means a life that's been changed on the inside and the outside. And there's evidence for that. There's there's fruit that shows that the, that the life has been changed. And so the Bible often pictures people like fruit trees that produce fruit, depending on the kind of tree they are. And as believers, when we act on the knowledge and discernment that God has given us from his word and take steps out of love by faith, then we produce fruit. And that fruit, as we've already looked at, looks a lot like God because it's been shaped by God's word. It's been shaped by God's love. And so we begin to act and look and sound like God. We don't become God, but we begin to reflect him more and more in our lives. In fact, we're actually getting changed more and more into his likeness. Now, there's three kinds of fruit that the Bible talks about in uh, scripture. One is new believers. New believers are actually called a type of fruit or harvest. Jesus in Luke 10 verse 2 says that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So believers here are likened to a harvest or to fruit. Uh, but there's also a way in which the Bible describes fruit as being an emotion or an attitude that the Spirit produces in us. This is what Paul's getting at in Galatians 5, verse 22 to 23, on the fruit of the Spirit, when he describes that the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, patience. These are all things that God is, is producing in our affections and in our emotions. It's a good thing. It's a good fruit. But there's a third kind of fruit that Paul also talks about, and that is new godly actions and behaviors. And this is what's actually being talked about in our passage today, where God is producing a fruit of righteousness in the believer's life. There's evidence that, that they have been made right with God, and now it's coming out in acts of righteousness outwardly to others. This is very similar to how Hebrews 12, 11 speaks of the fruit of righteousness. It says, For in the moment all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant. But later, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. But what is this fruit of righteousness that is being talked about here? Well, it's actually a collective term that Paul is using to really describe all sorts of different kinds of good, righteous actions and behaviors, but particularly something he's mentioned in verse 10, two words a pure life and a blameless life. It says that, that we are to be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. And now this pure life refers to the holy character on the inside. On the inside. This is kind of holiness on the inside so that there aren't any hidden sins. Or any, there isn't any hypocrisy. And this is really getting at the idea of uh, this word comes from being sun-tested, sun-tested. Uh, in the ancient Near East, you would have uh, people who would make pottery. And the really expensive kind, the high-end pottery, would be beautifully uh, shaped and thin. Uh, it was nice and thin, and yet uh, in its making, because it's so difficult to make thin pottery, it would often crack in the firing process. But in order to really make money and, and salvage the pottery, the artist would then fill in the cracks with this clear wax and then paint over it and sell it for top dollar as if it was a pure, uncracked jar. But what people would do in the market, they would have to sun test it. They would take some pottery and they would hold it up to the sun and allow the sunlight to get through it 
so that they could see all the cracks that the sunlight would reveal, and they would know whether it was a pure pot or not. Well, our hearts are almost like these pots. But amazingly, God doesn't just lift our hearts up to the sun just to see all our cracks. But instead, what he does is he puts the sun inside of our hearts by the Spirit in order by his light to forgive and heal all of our cracks. And by his heat, refine and purge into us holiness. God has actually put his son inside of us to change us so that there, there would be no more uh, hidden sins or idolatry, anything that would prevent us from producing this fruit of purity. And so Paul is, is talking about the fruit of righteousness, particularly in a pure life, this holy character on the inside. But he also talks about being blameless. And that's really looking about, that's looking at holy character and conduct on the outside, this holy conduct on the outside. It's getting at being, um, it, it literally means not to stumble in what we do or not to give offense to somebody else in what we've done. It means that we're above reproach, that if someone were to accuse us of something, that it wouldn't stick, it just kind of slide off like Teflon because of the life of integrity that we have. We're blameless. And this is what God works in us and produces in our lives. And they, they go together. If you have one without the other, you have hypocrisy. And God's not really interested in having a bunch of cracked pots that are just pretty and painted on the outside, but on the inside are moldy and rotten and not worth using. No, what he wants to do is completely transform us from the inside out. And that our purity actually fuels and leads to blameless living. And that blameless living then actually reinforces a pure heart. And they, they work together. There's a consistency. And that's exactly what God wants to do in producing the fruit of righteousness in our life. Purity and blamelessness. Now, you might be thinking, you know, that sounds really great and all, but that's impossible. I mean, who can actually do that? And the truth is, is that we can't. We, we can't do this on our, on our own, by ourselves. But that's why Paul assures us in verse 11 that this fruit comes through Jesus Christ. It comes through Jesus Christ. All the fruit that is ever produced in our life is the result of Christ working in us and through us. He is the true vine that produces and provides all of the necessary nutrients that we need from the Word and all of the life-giving sap that we need by the Holy Spirit. And He gives this all to us, His branches, in order to produce through us His fruit. This is so encouraging. He's the one who lovingly provides all that we need. We can't fabricate this true, this fruit. We, we can't manufacture it. We can't forge it with our own hands. It has to be produced by his hands and his hands alone, by his spirit, in our heart, through our lives. And so what's our role in this? What's, what, what part do we play in bearing fruit? And it really comes down to faith. Our faith and the acts of of obedience that flow from faith. Romans 1 verse 5 talks about the obedience of faith, the obedience that flows from faith. All we're called to do is to trust God in his word and then to take steps of faith in obedience to God's word by his spirit. And together, that then the Spirit does the rest. The fruit of the Spirit is produced in our life as we believe, as we believe the Word, and then take a step of faith in obedience to the Word. This is what Jesus is getting at in John chapter 6, verse 28 to 29, when he was asked, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom God has sent. Colossians 2 6 says the same thing. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. We receive Jesus by faith 
And so we walk in him by faith. The same faith that saved us is the same faith that sanctifies us. It's faith in Jesus Christ from beginning to end. And so we might wonder after all this conversation about fruit, what's the big deal? Why are we talking about fruit? Why is this such a big thing to God? And that's because of what verse 10 says. It's because of the day of Christ. The day of Christ. Paul prays that these believers would be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. A phrase that he's used already in verse 6. That's the time when God will complete the good work that he's begun in us on the day of Jesus Christ. The day that Jesus returns, the day that he comes to save us and glorify us and transform us and evaluate us, testing all that we have done and all the fruit of our life, looking at all that we have done and the time that he has given us on earth to do his plans and purposes. And so this is what, why it's such a, a big deal. Second Corinthians Chapter 5, verse 10, describes this day of Christ. It says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Paul further explains this judgment seat of Christ, this day of testing, in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11 to 15. And instead of using the analogy of fruit, he switches over to building materials. He says, no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. It's the gospel. Now, if anyone builds on that foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive an award, a reward. If anyone's work is burnt up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Paul here emphasizes that all believers are going to be saved on this day. This is not a, a judgment of whether someone goes to heaven or to hell. They've already trusted in Christ. They're going to heaven. This is a judgment of stewardship, of how did someone use their time while on earth, the time that God gave them to steward, to manage for his plans and purposes. And this is why fruit bearing is so important. It's not like God's just getting an ROI on us, not just getting a return on investment of what he has done in our life. It's more than that. It's actually a record of how much he was worth to us during our life. The fruit is like a record of that. The fruit is a journal that shows how much we love and treasured him during our lifetime. It testifies and is a testimony to his glory and worth in our own life life. And this is the fifth and final thing that Paul prays for in verse 11, that everything, all of our life, all of the fruit that he produces in our life, it would all be to the glory and praise of God, to the glory and praise of God. This is the main purpose of Paul's prayer, the main purpose of his life, the main purpose of the Philippians' lives, the main purpose in our lives, that everything, everything about us, including all the fruit that he produces in our life, would be to his praise and glory and honor and credit, so that he would be praised above all for all that he has done and produced in our life. Jesus says as much in John 15, verse 8, he says, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. You know, God gets much glory when there is much fruit produced in our life. It's a record of all the times during our life that we trusted in him rather than in someone else, where we believed his word above others, where we followed him instead of following something else 
when we loved and treasured and worshiped him more than anything else in that moment, that produced a fruit. And that fruit told a story about how worth God is, his worthiness, how much of a treasure he is above everything else. And so that's why fruit points to his glory. It glorifies God. It magnifies God. This is why Paul prays that our love would abound more and more, filled with knowledge and all discernment so that we would be able to approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the praise and the glory of God, so that our life would be a, a journal, a testament, a story about how much better God is than anything he's ever made and anything this world could ever offer. And when we see him, when he returns, he will test all things by fire. And whatever is produced by the word and by the spirit, it will last. It will last. It's like fireproof fruit. It will go through the fire and make it. But whatever is from the flesh will not make it. Whatever, le whatever weeds are left in the field, they'll get gathered up and burnt. Whatever dead branches are on the limbs, they'll get gathered up and burnt. Whatever is from the word and from the spirit through our life by faith, whatever has been from a fruit of faith in God's word and by his spirit will last and will testify to the glory of God. And so are we ready? for that day? Are we ready for the day of Christ to see Jesus? If you've never put your faith in Christ as Savior and Lord, then today is that day that the first step of faith that would produce the fruit of salvation in your life is to trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of all of your sins and to surrender your life fully to him, to follow him all your days. And he will begin to transform your life and produce fruit in your life and you'll be ready for the day of Christ. And Christian, are you ready? Are you ready to see Jesus? Are you ready to see his great and glorious appearing? His light that will outshine the sun, his voice that will thunder all around the world, his eyes that will see into the very hearts of people and expose the very motives and intentions of their heart? Are you ready to hear his question that he will ask you on that day? My child, give glory to God and to praise his name and tell me now what you have done. Will you be able to reply, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Here, I have made five talents more. Or will you be able to say, Lord, you planted the gospel in my heart and you watered and nurtured it all my life. Here is the fruit of your labor. Here is the reward of your suffering. Here is the fruit that you produce, 30, 60, 100 fold. Will you hear Jesus say to you on that day, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a little. Welcome, enter into the joy of your master. Do you long to hear Jesus' voice to say these words to you? Well, if so, let us follow the wisdom that God has given us in Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2, which says, let us, let us throw aside everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Let us run the race that has been marked out for us. It is our desire to fix our eyes on Christ, to run this race, and to get off of us anything that would prevent us from producing the maximum amount of fruit in our lives. What is keeping us from bearing much fruit? Do we need to purge from our homes sugar and snacks and cookies and chocolate in order that we might remember what it is to taste and see that the Lord is good? Do we need to purge our lips from grumbling and gossiping and coarse joking so that we might bear the, the fruit of lips of being full of thanksgiving and speaking truth and love toward one another? Do we need to purge our eyes 
so that from Netflix or from our Instagram account, so that we might fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith? Do we need to go to bed early and, and set our alarm so that we can get to the feet of Jesus in the morning and talk to him and pray to him and learn what it is again to pray the Lord's Prayer from the heart our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What is it in our life? What are, what are the habits and the hobbies that need to be cut out? And what are the habits and hobbies that need to be cultivated and stirred up that lead to godliness, that bears much fruit for his glory and praise so that we will be ready for that day? I would encourage us to start right here, to start right at this prayer and begin to ask God, praying this prayer, God, what is that next step that you would have me to take that would clear the soil, that would prepare me and position me to bear as much fruit as possible? God, I, I surrender myself to you. I want you, God, by your spirit to produce much fruit, not just a little, as much fruit as possible for your name's sake in my life. We want to be ready for when he comes and he's nearer now than he ever was before. Praise God that he's given us everything we need to bear much fruit. He's given us his word. He's given us his spirit and he's given us one another that we might walk together in love and good deeds. And so we are going to pray. We're going to ask God, Lord, would you do this in our life for your name's sake? Let us pray. Father, how blessed we are to be given this prayer. And so this is our prayer. God, would you, would you cause our love to abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that we may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ when you return, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through you, that comes through Christ, all to the glory and praise of your name. Oh, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, we bless you and we thank you. For yours is the kingdom and the glory, and the power, and the honor, and the praise. Lord, would you get all the glory, not only in our story and in our lives, but from all the fruit that you produce in us. All glory be to your name, we pray. Amen.
the world behind me. The cross before me. The world behind me. The cross before me. World behind. The cross before me. No turning back. No turning back No turning back Lord, and let me suffer Decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turn. Thank you.